So thanks a lot for the introduction. So we are standing here together and uh, what do you want to talk about? Uh, how we at Intelligence use CloudStack? Uh, it's, a, it's a big thing for us and as uh, uh, Gi uh, Giles, sorry, as Steve mentioned, uh, for us it's especially important to have stability on our platforms uh, to serve um, uh, what we are doing and I try to explain a little bit what is the background of this and then uh, Sebastian will come to the technical details. Okay, I'm head of intelligence, global managed services, cloud infrastructure services. Forget about the name. I will try to explain in my words uh, w w what the background is. Twitter, LinkedIn. But more important about my person, so I like running. So and I, I have two requests to you. Because uh, this is a real picture. So I, I was uh, in the metro in Shanghai. So was really funny so the, I was running a marathon and later on I found a picture of me in the metro so you have to arrange that I got a first run here in London and then a picture in the metro. Now, Seven, okay can I take your word? Absolutely. E even if, if Brexit is done so. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no but I would really love to run here once at least. Okay, but coming back to the figures, what is Intelligence? So Intelligence is a company about 8,000 people and its origin is an SAP consulting company. So it was found, I guess, 20 years ago, something like this, and really started as a pure consulting company. Huh? Who knows SAP? Oh, that's actually good. So usually at these conferences, uh, you have only 20%. Okay. But, but, but this you have to remind we are around 8,000 people so not small anymore um, and yeah uh, 25 countries okay and as I said all we are doing is related to SAP yeah it's slowly changing that we're also making something left and right but all we are doing with uh, uh, has to do with SAP yeah? and that means clearly starting consulting but the portion of, yeah, call it hosting or managed cloud, we call it internally, is becoming bigger and bigger. Yeah? So it's becoming also more important for the company to host and serve the SAP applications. Yeah, and there we have a problem, yeah, not a problem, but uh, something, uh, yeah, the, the, the SAP software is hardly cloud ready. Yeah? So not, not small, tiny virtual machines where you can scale and move it around. No, unfortunately not. Uh, SAP is done even the other way. So it's going to really big systems. So they have a strategy to implement on all their or most of their application SAP HANA, which is a really huge uh, uh, memory based database. Yeah. So that leads to the fact that we have systems yeah, up to 12 TB currently. I already saw 24 uh, uh, TB systems. Yes, uh, and usually the very big systems are not on a virtualized environment anymore, so they are running on bare metal. But usually now we virtualize uh, HANA databases up to uh, 2 terabyte. Yeah? But this brings a lot of um, yeah, problems. Yeah, as I said, and, and it's really so such a database is starting for one and a half hour. Yeah? So not that you can just move it and start it and upscale and so on. It's simply not possible. Yeah? So uh, and installation times, clearly you have some small applications where it uh, took 15 minutes, but you have also installation times uh, longer than eight hours yeah, for such an application. So it's a very mighty one. Yeah, and this you always have to consider when we are talking about our special use cases, how to operate cloud or, or hosting systems. Yeah, because um, these um, make some things uh, more difficult. Okay, uh, what we are doing there? Um, so as I said, I'm at the head of cloud infrastructure services. That means basically I'm responsible for all the data centers or for all remote operations of our customers on an infrastructure layer. So basically our responsibility ends uh, on the operating system level. Excuse me. Uh, you, you leave our talk, so. <laughs> 
okay, so that, that's our technical responsibility. Basically to operate everything, whether it's in our own data centers or on the customer data centers up to the operating system level. Yeah? So we have around 40, uh, uh, 30, 430 uh, colleagues in six locations because we have six data centers. Yeah, US, Poland, Malaysia, Germany, Switzerland and Denmark. Yeah. So very small ones, for example, Malaysia and Germany, it's the biggest one, so it varies a little bit. But we have around uh, 10,000 uh, what we call server instances or SAP instances. Yeah? So this is just to give you an impression uh, what is behind. Usually uh, with the dual data center strategy, yeah, you have uh, yeah, redundancy and so on, because this is quite important for such uh, heavy applications. Okay, uh, and now coming back to the important thing here, uh, to CloudStack. So I had the first touch point with CloudStack, I guess in 2014, or 2013, 2014. So because we started there an innovation project, yeah? we wanted to, uh, okay, establish a cloud management platform. Usually, usually you start with a small test environment and you start to test things out. And we quickly uh, decided for, for CloudStack. Yeah? And yeah, then we started our, our testing stuff and so on. Sebastian uh, is, is there from the beginning. He can uh, talk all, all, all the details. But we were really impressed by the CloudStack and then decided um, also to yeah, um, uh, join officially the community and made what uh, Steve was uh, telling in 2013 in also the first European user conference outside London in Berlin yeah and founded the German uh, user group yeah? together with Heinlein so some of the colleagues are there uh, yeah uh, and uh, this is the history okay but still uh, it was quite limited on a yeah testing training uh, Q&A environment yeah so uh, we did not take the step uh, to bring it into real production uh, so clearly our, our, also our test and uh, training systems are productive systems, but real productive systems. But this changed recently because we decided uh, basically in July to extend our uh, 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 cloud stack environment to all of our data centers. Yeah? So we analyzed a lot of uh, different product, cloud forms, cloud board and so on. But finally, uh, you know, it's a big company, you cannot decide it quickly, but finally the decision comes to cloud stack. And now we are under really high pressure to get this enabled on, on, on all our uh, data centers. Yeah? So we have three phases, clearly the own data centers, which will start with Germany, hopefully we'll finalize this year, then coming with Poland. But then we, we, we need to do on top uh, uh, AWS and Azure integration, which is quite important for us. And the uh, next piece, the phase four is where we really want to add additional uh, application automation on, on top of it. Yeah? So clearly we focus on the infrastructure layer first, but as you see these long installation times, so this is really a problem for our administrators because yeah, you have to do a lot of things manually and we really want to automate the uh, SAP application installation as well. So some use cases we already have, but basically we, we need much more to be more, more efficient. Okay, that's for introduction and now Sebastian will show us hopefully how we do it. Uh, my name is Sebastian and yeah, I'm working since a couple of years at Intelligence. Yeah, and as Andre said, my main responsibilities of what I do most of the day is uh, working with CloudStack. Uh, I'm writing a lot of Ansible automation and um, yeah, handling the Ceph cluster, which is our storage backend for this testing environment at the moment. Yeah. And the rest of the day, Linux stuff, OS configurations, the whole infrastructure, all you need, all the services you need in a, in a cloud environment at the end. I also have some social accounts and yeah, here's some links to, to our other meetups in Germany you can find in the presentation. So my agenda for today I will give you a short overview about our used technologies then a bit more about 
our cloud stack setup and some features which are already implemented in cloud stack and which we use for our customers and how we present these features to the customers via the customer portal we have and then a bit more about the other central services we offer for the customer and a bit deeper look to the automation and how we do this stuff. So first this test environment which we have already running now is of course running on cloud stack so used for the orchestration of storage network and the compute. Uh, we have KVM as a hypervisor and Ceph as storage backend. We isolate the machines on the old VLAN uh, way and yeah, use Ansible to automate everything. So we have a rule automation first and this is all done by Ansible. Some central services we offer to the customer is uh, ADAP for the authentication. Uh, we use CheckMK for the monitoring backup PC for a very traditional uh, file-based backup <coughs> yeah and DNS repositories and some other stuff so first this is an overview how all the components working together so on top we have it's just a point yes uh, we have a portal so um, for our customer this is the stuff he can see from the infrastructure and all the services he, he has. So he only have one entry point. So when we started, you see all these little uh, services. We had just like a, a, a page with a couple of links and then you can go for creating a VM cloud stack for monitoring this and that and this is not working so we wanted to have one entry point and uh, we created at the end this customer cloud management portal um, everything you do in there or the customer does is uh, then triggering um, with by the Ansible daemon I will tell you more about this later uh, the Ansible automation and Ansible then configures all the underlying services so for example it uh, deploys a new VM in cloud stack then it configures the monitoring and the backup for example and of course all the stuff which we need inside the VM and in the UI for the customer the customer can see all this the services So now come to the cloud stack features we already use. First, a bit more about the setup. So we use the advanced networking networking setup. So we have virtual routers. We use domains, projects, and all this stuff. Um, we use the domains for the customer separation. So each customer gets its own domain, and then we use projects inside the domains to separate for example um, the dev environment database environment or this team and that team so they have this one isolated network with their systems in it and the project also gives us the possibility to uh, account the systems for the customer so each project has its own bill at the end um, the first feature I will show you is uh, the quota feature of CloudStack. So on domain level we don't use any quotas, so everything is minus one, all open, but we use it on a project level. So when we create a new project we have some standards. Um, you can see here on the right hand side the picture how it is configured in CloudStack and uh, underneath this is the view in the portal so the customer sees all the time uh, what he is consuming at the moment and what is the maximum he can consume of any resource so we do this 
of course to protect on one hand side the customer so as you know if, if, if one guy has the possibility to create stuff he does it all the time and not um, someone has to pay the bill so we, we stopped this at, at one moment this is uh, the quota and on the other hand it also protects us so everyone wants to have a cloud cloud is unlimited um, as we as the technicians know it isn't that way so it protects us as well and just for the notice uh, this little uh, global variable um, in cloud stake um, we saw an older version this this uh, um, value wasn't set so this meant uh, you could create a lot of uh, virtual machines until you hit the quota and then if you removed stuff it wasn't recalculated the quota so new versions it is set to five minutes I only know uh, 411 but before this value wasn't set so and I, I only noticed this because on, on some conferences I saw guys manipulating the database and reset the quota by hand directly in the database you don't have to do this um, another thing we um, we use is of course the DNS so and as I said uh, we have um, isolated networks with a virtual router in front of it so when we started we, we gave uh, the customer the possibility to use cloud stack itself to have the, the interface of cloud stack and we thought okay this is a good way now the user can create the systems and the volumes and destroy it and do whatever he wants um, but we realized very quickly that it isn't that easy at the end a lot of guys uh, struggle with the network so what the hell is the firewall port forwarding static NAT and so on and so we decided okay we, we have to do it in a different way and um, we use automation for this and now we just um, create a static net IP when we deploy a new VM on the VR and directly do a static net to this system so what ends you have at the end two IPs for the same system a lot of users can't remember IPs so you have DNS names but inside the isolated network that works because we use the virtual router which is which does the DNS uh, for us but if you use your laptop for example and are not uh, you are not inside this this isolated network the DNS resolution doesn't work so at the moment we uh, have a naming convention for this and we set on on the project level uh, um, a network domain which is um, the name of the project, the name of the domain, the geolocation and the domain itself. So that gives us the possibility to make sure that each system has a different name. And then we just use the automation to put the host name with the, the project, the domain and the geolocation into one big zone means the location one data center or? yes oh, okay. yes at the end one one data center so where we end is we have one dns name and two ibs which are resolving to the to, so the name resolves outside the isolated network to the static net ip on the virtual router which is this one and inside the isolated domain you use the uh, virtual router DNS resolver and you get the internal IP. So what DNS services you use in your data center? Bind. Bind. So you yes. the bind configuration of right? Yes, okay. yes. We modify the zone when we deploy a VM and when we destroy the VM.
we use Ansible to modify the zone. <laughs> Sorry? You assume that virtual other IP address will not change. You, uh, there is no possibility to change the IP. We can do this by hand, of course, but as long as no one has access to the to cloud stack, uh, we can make sure that the customer can't change the IP. So you only can remove the complete system and create a new one, and then the automation will first destroy the, the DNS entry and bind, and then create a new one for the new system. So. And this uh, by configuration, is it triggered by the uh, cloud stack or by the upper layer system? No, by Ansible. Yeah, I, I understand it's uh, implemented with Ansible, but the, the, the action is it triggered by the cloud stack when you create a virtual machine in cloud stack? No, no, no. It's by the upper layer system that you have developed. That's the, uh, when you create anything. Mm -hmm. via the portal. Okay. At the end you will trigger automation and this automation triggers then cloud stack to for example deploy the VM and then gets the name and then it configures the bind server, the external and that's yeah, the way it thanks. works. Yeah. Any other questions? So far? Yeah, I'm starting to understand the, the static NAT IP. Is that are those for like public IPs? Yes, yes. We have, uh, we, we acquire a public IP on the virtual router in the network in this, in this project, and then we do a static NAT to the newly created system. So every VM you have? Yes, okay. yes. Every VM has at the end two IPs. Okay. The internal, which really resists on the system, and the external, which is on the VR. Okay. Uh, another feature we heavily use is uh, the tagging feature of CloudStack. So we have uh, a lot of tags on a lot of uh, objects in CloudStack. For example, on the project, we have a tag for the Ansible host, which is responsible for this project and all VMs which are inside this project. Uh, then we have a lot of tags uh, on the VM object itself. So some of them are visible for the customer via the portal. For example, um, who created the system is just a tag or is the backup or the monitoring service enabled and uh, some of them are not visible to the customer and just for the administrators for example um, which playbook created the system <coughs> and even on, on which branch and which commit was the playbook when we created the system to have a very easy debugging so we can directly, okay, there's an error and we see, okay, this, uh, the automation was on this git branch and this commit, so we can fix it very easy. Um, we have a text on volumes for, for a customer comment. We want to extend this in the future to put maybe a, a tag on the volume for the file system and the mount point to give the user the possibility to not only attach a new volume to the VM, to say, okay, I want to have this file system, this mount point, and we can very easily remove the volume as well without any errors during a reboot or something because someone missed the FS tab or something like this. And um, we have one tag we could have on every object. Uh, this is for the billing information. For example, we give a... a Don't give any discount. <laughs> if we would give any discounts, we could have a tag on every object, even on the domain or project or VM or volume or whatever it is. Um, no, but more about the other central services we have, uh, apart from cloud stack. So uh, what Andre said before, um, our goal is to offer the customer a service where he can just decide, I want to have this application. Please create this application with all its needs. So it means the VM with the volumes, with the kernel parameters and so on. So this is all done via Ansible. So 
in case of, of, of a VM, Ansible will trigger CloudStack to create the virtual machine with this OS and the size and, and whatever is needed. The storage configures all the network. In case of application, it, it makes all the firewall stuff this port to this port, this protocol and so on because we have a HANA database and we need these ports to be open to connect to the database and so on. Um, then it will do the complete OS configuration because we have only plain templates, means a plain template Debian, clean template slash and so on with, without any configuration except the little password script. But at the end we have only five or six templates which are really plain. So we do all the OS configuration for the application, the content parameters and so on via Ansible. On the system itself we configure the whole authentication and authorization on the system itself. With LDAP there we have the same structure like we have in, in CloudStack. We have an organizational unit for every customer and then a lot of groups for every project. So we can separate, okay, this is a user in this project, this is an admin in this project and so on. We use groups, which has a naming convention to the project. Yeah. Then if the customer enables monitoring, it also does the whole configuration in our uh, monitoring system and then monitors the, the OS or even the application. Um, it configures the backup if the customer enables it, even for application specific stuff. So if you directly choose, okay, I want to create a HANA database, the backup uses this template to backup the, the database as well. Yeah. And of course, as I said, we, we configure all the DNS stuff by Ansible. Um, this is a little picture about the network uh, structure and how it looks like. So we have an, a red, this Ansible host, which configures then if you trigger something, the central services. Some of them are placed behind the customer project, like CloudStack and configures the services inside the project, like the backup or the monitoring. So we have slaves for, for example, for monitoring on each of those red systems. And of course, it then can configure the VM itself. So this is a little example about the automation and how the stuff works. So this, oh, yeah, you can't really read it well, but okay, I try to explain it. Um, with number one, this is what the customer has in the, in, the, in the user portal. So he has, for example, in this case, an upgrade system button. So what we do at the end is we say this button is equals this piece of automation. The portal uses our own written Ansible daemon to read out the automation. In the automation, we say, okay, which is written by the, by the administrators, to run the automation successfully, we need following information. We need the VM name, we need is the reboot allowed after the, the upgrade, and we need the CloudSec domain and the CloudSec project. So some of the information can easily be provided via the portal because the customer is in this project on this VM. So we directly, or the portal directly knows the CloudSec domain, the CloudSec project and the VM name. <coughs> but one information the portal doesn't know is, is the reboot allowed? So in this case, the portal will show the customer this is the, the, the value is boolean, so you only have a checkbox where you can say the customer has to say is the reboot allowed or not. And if he has provided all the information we need, he triggers OK, and then the automation is running with all the information the automation needs to run successfully. 
that's the way the automation works. So this was a really easy example. Excuse me, yeah. it's part of the portal that you made or you have some product to do all this? No, this, this is part of the portal. So the portal, you have this user interface, which is called the portal, which reads all the services, cloud stack, the backup, the monitoring and so on. And we have uh, created the second part. This is uh, called the daemon. And this daemon is triggered via the portal to give the portal the information what is needed to run this automation. And then the portal creates uh, dynamically the interface for this. So for example, if we as administrators who are writing the, the code for the automation need, oh, need a DVM name, for example, if you create a new VM, we need a VM name. Then we need, need the size of the VM. We need the OS. Yeah. And we as administrators write this in the code. We need so this you information. Very, you can very easily add new services by just adding definition and you don't need to do it in the interface. Yes, we don't need to do it in the interface, we just do it in the automation. So if we cut out this piece of code in the automation, you wouldn't have this checkbox. Yeah. So, very easy example. Yeah, maybe it's a more, more backwards would be because we had before, uh, before always the problem that you had to put in the developer and the admin together. Yeah, or even yeah. three admins and two developers. I see. And this gives a lot of interdependencies and takes forever. Yeah, right? and therefore and now it's much easier to yeah. write it or, or customize different tasks. Yes. yes. So, so at the end, the developer uh, don't uh, need the knowledge what is necessary to do in the infrastructure when I want to do this and that. So this is done by the administrators who write just the automation and the developers can really concentrate on the user interface. So, but things become much more complicated if you uh, want to do this all with applications. So we have to define as the administrators um, what we need for an application. Okay, you have the easy stuff, for example, for a database, the, the, the password or some ID or whatever it is, but um, you start with one version of one maybe application, but then you become the next version of the same application and another version and another version and another version. And you, of course, could say, okay, we only offer one version but that's not possible. So at the end, you end up with a lot of version and you have to make um, relations. Means if I choose um, the database in this version, I can use this OS version. But if I use another version of the database, I also have to use this OS version. So we have a lot of uh, relations between the, the the values you can choose as, as the end user. So you have to define this somewhere in the automation because you have the same problem. The developer of the user interface doesn't know what relations you have. So we have to define this in the automation. And we even uh, put all the translations in the automation and the hints in the portal. So if you have this text box, what do I have to put in there? So, for example, VM name. So we put all this in the automation because we know as writer of the uh, automation what we need in this or that box. So, and things become much, much more uh, complicated if you want to deploy complete application stacks. Then you have much more relations because, for example, you have a backend database and front end, and this has to be on different servers then you have much more relations between this version and this version, this OS and this OS, and you, yeah, we put all this in the automation. So this is just a definition language here? Yes, it's yes, we define. Uh, exactly, uh, exactly. How do you store your configuration, actual facts that what customer has requested have run? So sizes of the VMs. No, no, no. Um, we define an automation. Okay, for example, you have a HANA database. So we offer three sizes. For example, 64 gigabyte, 128 gigabyte, and 256 gigabyte. These are the normal sizes. But we also offer the possibility to choose the size on your own. 
So I want to use this size of the server and then I want to have this volume, the log volume, 100 gigabyte and this and that. So you can, at the end, we, we make the possibilities, but we have still the relations. If you use this version of the database, you have to use this version of the OS, for example. So what we're doing next, so as I said, we, we have at the moment, yes? How do you do the um, development or the, the for, for all the versions connected to each other? How do you handle that? Yeah. yeah at at Jenkins or? No. No, at the moment it's done by us, all the testing and, and the development of the automation because it sometimes changes. So you have to, to adapt the, the automation as well, but we want finally that the guys who know the application, for example the SAP administrators who are responsible for the application, write the automation. So. As we said, this, this environment at the moment is completely KVM itself and stuff. And at the moment we are heavily working together with ShapeBlue uh, on the VMware integration. Um, we also want to, to, to include IBM Power9 to be configurable via our portal. And as Andre already said, we want also to integrate hyperscaler. We don't have the question. Question. Yes. Um, and we'll the slide where the user sees the resources is used. Yes. And this quota and stuff. Yes. How do you get that? Is something you store separately, or do you pick it up by API, or just with a DB? Uh, no, we we just uh, do an API call to Cloud Stack. This, the portal reads all the time all the services. In this case, CloudStack is the service which is providing the quota for us and directly tells us, okay, what do we already use? So we just do an API call. Is it correct whenever I have an action, it's only possible over the Ansible daemon, but all the reading stuff is directly over here. Yes, all the... Everything you want to change, so it's a write operation is done by Ansible, and all the reading stuff is done by the by the portal itself. So the portal never ever triggers at the end the action or manipulates a service or something. This is all done by Ansible. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so you said that you deploy and manage applications with this portal. Yes. But do you have bare metal uh, deployments uh, automation? No, not at the moment. At the moment, this is completely virtualized. So, so it's all on KVM, all virtual systems. So you can break uh, virtual machines, and uh, you expect that the new virtual machines that are started are capable to be managed by Ansible with all the stuff. We deploy it via Ansible, so we definitely know that it is manageable with Ansible because if it wouldn't be manageable by Ansible, the, the automation would fail and then the customer in the portal sees, okay, th this failed. And do you have any plans to, to, or need to do uh, bare metal deployments, uh, operating system installs or something like this? Not at the moment. Okay, thanks. The VMware project, is it going to be managed by the same cloud stack installation or a different one? No. Um, at the moment, the, the, the cloud stack installation, uh, installation for, for the VMware stuff is a different one. But yeah, finally, you could use just one for one geolocation, one cloud stack instance, yeah. and manage VMware and KVM. Sorry, another question. Um, so you mentioned that some installations take like eight hours and stuff. Yes. But all your templates are basically plain. Plain. Yes. Um, are your installations that different? Would it save time if you actually had like templates that had <coughs> the eight hours? And it would. It would. Yeah, yeah. To do it with templates would save a lot of time because you could easily just deploy the template and done. Mm -hmm. But you have um, disadvantages massive disadvantages <laughs> with templates. First, for each version of each application, each OS, you have a different template. So you end up with, with tons of templates So and someone has to 
to refresh all the templates. So we want, we said, okay, we, we, we can't handle this. this. This is not working. We just, then, okay, the time, more time is needed to create a complete system from scratch with the automation, but it saves us a lot of work with the templates. And the other thing is, if you, for example, have an, an application, an, an database application, and you have an ID somehow in this application, you have to make sure not that, that every system has a different ID. And sometimes you have applications where you only can set the ID when you install the application. So template is not working again. So and this is why we decided, okay, sometimes the automation takes much longer compared to a template, but, but it brings much more benefits. And even you have some applications where you have to do a lot of handwork after the installation itself. And this is a thing we just put in the automation and we are done. And then we are faster, much faster. Uh, what if uh, last year or so, uh, something like that, uh, you were talking about backup, backup PC, and I remember correctly, you were looking into perhaps not using it, uh, maybe hook something into Seth directly. I remember. Right. Did you make any progress? Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now you have to differ between backup and snapshot. Yeah. Snapshot you could do easily with, with Ceph and we do it at the moment and we are playing around with it, but, but Snapshot is not backup. So backup yeah. is definitely another thing. Okay, there, there is another possibility, okay, with, with all the Ansible stuff, you could go on the virtual system, say squeeze, go to the storage backend, trigger the snapshot, and then maybe if you're a lucky guy, you have a consistent snapshot, but at the end, it's, it's not a backup. So, and f for the backup, we, in the data centers, for the, all the VMware stuff, we have a different thing, not, not backup PC, and we have to integrate this right now because it's already set and already working in all data centers. So you're happy with backup PC? For <laughs> it's working. Yeah. It's working. <laughs> so, if there are any further questions for Sebastian, can you hold that afterwards? Because we are getting a bit ahead, a bit behind here. And okay. oh, so please hold sorry. the questions. Okay. Never mind. Much as I'd love to hear him speak all afternoon. All right. Sebastian. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>